I'm exhorting you to go to your seat. Oh, it didn't work. Surprise. Just a couple announcements before I introduce Pastor Shear, which probably doesn't need one. The coffee mugs that you have that say Zion Lutheran on those, don't put them back. That's your mug to keep. So if you get a coffee mug, that's your mug. So you can take that back with you and remember Zion Lutheran Church in your daily prayers as we continue to live in this haven of confessional Lutheranism known as the Texas District. Um, we also have a lot of snacks out now. So after the breakfast, we have snacks as well that are in the um, hall over here at both tables on both sides of the wall and drinks. So if you get a little hungry throughout the morning, there's a little snack for you there. After the two morning uh, lectures, we will have worship again at noon in the sanctuary. Pastor Wurgau, I don't know where he went. Where'd Sam go? Sam's not here. Uh, Pastor Wurgau will be our preacher, and we will be doing responsive prayer too. So I encourage you to go to that. And then after that, we have about an hour and a half break for lunch. Fun times. Anyone have any questions just about layout of the facility or anything you're confused about? Good. Our next presenter is Pastor Shear. Man, my bio was a lot shorter. Is the senior pastor of Our Savior Lutheran Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He's also the editor-in-chief at Steadfast Lutherans, overseeing all the various projects and work being done for the organization. He serves the Wyoming District of the Missouri Senate as its stewardship chairman and has been a regular speaker at his district men's retreats. He's also one of the hosts of Concord Matters, a radio version of a book of Concord reading group on KFUO Radio. He was awarded a BA in history with highest honors from Minnesota State University, Mankato, in 2002. He received his MDiv from CTS in Fort Wayne in 2008 and was ordained in June 2008 and served at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Bagley, Bagley, Minnesota for three years prior to being called to his current parish in Cheyenne. He has spoken at Lutheran Free Conferences and will be speaking at the Wyoming District Pastors Conference this spring on the topic of error and fellowship. <laughs> he has written extensively for the blog, The Brothers of John the Steadfast, Around the Word Journal, various other devotionals, is working on writing and editing a two-volume devotional for pastors and their wives entitled, Since You Have Appointed Me, Since You Have Appointed Him. That sounds fun. He holds associate membership in the Association of Confessing Evangelical Lutheran Congregations. He's married to Holly, who is the editor of The Sisters of Katie Lutheran, a regular writer for The Federalist. And they have been blessed with four children, Madeline, Genevieve, Wilhelm, and Frederick. Shear family lives on a 35-acre parcel of solitude in semi-rural Wyoming. Let's all give a hand to make Pastor Shear feel important. All right. Before I get into my presentation, there are a number of authors who are here that write for the blog. Uh, so if you would, if you write for Steadfast Lutherans, if you would uh, stand up, please. You'll see them around. So we got Pastor Niemannen. We have Scott Diekman, Tim Wood. And let's see, who else do we have? Dr. Phillips. You'll hear him later. Uh, Pastor Joe Abramson of the ELS is here. Uh, he actually is doing double duty this weekend. He's not only here, attending here and listening, but he'll be speaking at the conference, the, what is it, the Worldview Conference in San Antonio, right? Yeah, so thank you guys, and let's, uh, let's applaud those guys. Those uh, guys work hard. All right, I came down to Texas a little bit early because I have family down here in Texas and so forth, uh, but uh, one of the things we did on, was it Tuesday this week? is we went and we saw the tour of the painted churches, um, and which is a beautiful set of churches here in Texas, uh, old country-style churches, but uh, they are absolutely wondrous on the inside. Uh, one of them was, was called St. Mary's, so of course you can guess which, uh, which uh, Christianity that was, of course, Roman Catholic. Um, but what I'm going to speak about today is the conservative and radical reformations. And, and that kind of comes to play... It, in things like when you visit these churches, right? Uh, there was 
obviously the Roman Catholic churches, but then there were these Lutheran churches, which looked a lot like the Roman Catholic ones. But then by the end of the tour, we got to, we got to a Methodist church, and it was just bare walls and, and everything else. It was like, wow, that's quite a stark difference from where we start. Right? And that's really what conservative reformation, radical reformation, that's what it's going to be about, is, is this idea of, okay, we come from the Roman Catholic Church. That's what we come out of. That's what the Reformation's about. But why didn't we go along with the Calvinists? Why didn't we, you know, go bare white-walled with, you know, bare crosses if you have a cross at all? Uh, why, why did we stop? Why, why are we having crucifixes in our churches still? Um, if, if you watch, you know, uh, I'll just make fun of Pastor Bean just a little bit. You know, if you watch Pastor Bean and the guys from Gottesdienst in worship, doesn't it just come to mind, that's too Catholic, right? Well, well this is what we're talking about with, with a conservative reformation. Because um, these guys aren't too Catholic. Uh, they're, they're actually doing what Luther did in the Reformation. So, um, so you have this kind of stuff going on. You see it in architecture, in, in worship, and so forth. There, the St. Mary's Church was just beautiful, but of course there were some symbols there. There was the symbol of the two keys that were crossed, which we as Lutherans might think is the office of the keys, but of course then it had the triple tiara of the, of the, the Pope, so it was the Pope's symbol. Well, that wouldn't be in a Lutheran church, so okay, we'd get rid of that. But they had beautiful statues of, of Christ and other saints, like St. John the Baptist was at one of them and so forth. So these things would be acceptable for Lutherans. All right, so why, how do we get to that point? All right? Um, the guy who really starts out and coins this phrase conservative reformation is not a Missouri Synod Lutheran at all, but he is an American Lutheran. Uh, Charles Porterfield Crouth writes a book entitled uh, The Conservative Reformation and Its Theology, right, in which he describes how the Reformation came to be, but he said something in it that is rather striking. He says, it's not necessarily what the Reformation got rid of that defined it, it's what the Reformation retained that defined it. Uh, that is, you know, what, where did Luther draw the line? You know, why, why did he not throw out uh, all this other stuff like the other reformers did? So with that, I'm going to read you the last paragraph of the Book of Concord. So this is Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration. It's in Article uh, 12 and so forth. Uh, it comes up paragraph 40. But I'll read it for you because this is describing conservative reformation. Since now in the sight of God and of all Christendom, the entire church of Christ, we wish to testify to those now living and those who shall come after us that this declaration herewith presented concerning all the controverted articles aforementioned and explained and no other is our faith, doctrine, and confession in which we are also willing, by God's grace, to appear with intrepid hearts before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and give an account of it. And that we will neither privately nor publicly speak or write anything contrary to it, but by the help of God's grace intend to abide thereby. Therefore, after mature deliberation, we have in God's fear and with the invocation of his name attached our signatures with our own hand. The principle of the conservative reformation, then, is, is simply put, this is the faith. I'm going to hold on to it today. I'm going to hold on to it tomorrow for all the days that God gives me on this earth. And in fact, as our confessor said, this is the faith I'm going to confess on Judgment Day. This is over and against other reformations. Okay, so, so if you know your 1500s history, you have a few reformations that go on. You have, of course, the Lutheran Reformation that starts as we are going to celebrate in uh, the next year coming, right? 500 years ago and so forth. You then also have another reformation which grows out of the Lutheran Reformation but goes far, far beyond it, and that's what they call the Radical Reformation. And then you have these second generation reformations like the Calvinists and so forth, and then you have uh, the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. Okay, so there's all kinds of reformations. And of course, over this next couple of years, you're going to hear uh, the media is going to chime in. 
All kinds of church bodies are going to chime in. Non-Lutherans are going to chime in. Hey, even the Catholics are going to chime in about the Reformation. And so it's our job as Lutherans to really understand our Reformation because you're going to hear all kinds of airing caricatures of the Reformation. Uh, Pastor Feeney, uh, in, his next, in the next speech, will be addressing some of those concerns as well. Uh, so it's our job to know the Lutheran Reformation and to identify it over and against some of these other Reformations that went on. Uh, apart from that, the theology of something like a radical Reformation, as we'll get into in a second, really has come to infest ourselves. You see, the radical Reformation is a Reformation that's, that's kind of natural, and, and it just comes from the sinful heart. And so even in the LCMS, we'll see that there is a lot of radical Reformation going on. Okay? So, we'll start out with a little overview of the Radical Reformation. Uh, it, as I said, it, it kind of grows out at the same time as the Lutheran Reformation. Uh, it views the kingdom of God, in particular, as something that they could bring. This is something we condemn them for in the Augsburg Confession. Um, but they believe that they can bring the kingdom of God through their work, through their preparations, through their methods, that they're going to bring the kingdom and reign of Christ on earth. All right? So the Radical Reformation, uh, we know them today uh, as the Amish and the Mennonites and so forth. Those, those are the, the real heirs of the Radical Reformation. However, uh, many don't understand that the Radical Reformation begins by being revolutionary. Because if you're going to bring the kingdom of God here on earth, you are going to be very political. You are going to bring about revolt and revolution. And in fact, we'll talk about two instances of that in the Peasants' Rebellion and the Munster debacle, as it's sometimes referred to. So some theological things about the radicals. They view Luther as getting the ball rolling. Okay? You'll see even Calvinists refer to Luther this way. Oh yeah, Luther, he's good on some things, but he didn't go far enough. Right? And so radicals are the same way. That Luther kind of sets a trajectory rather than being a destination. That this is the faith. No, no, no. He sets us toward the direction we should be heading. Okay? So he just gets the ball rolling for them. Right? Um, they also have some, some strong things about, you know, theology can really never be fully known because, of course, uh, for the radical reformers, it's not sola scriptura. But it's, okay, Scripture's here, but now God is still doing a new thing. And so God has new revelations, new teachings that are coming forward all the time. Right? Uh, what is it, the UCC that has the slogan, God is still speaking? Right? Yeah, that's kind of a good example of that, right? So some characteristics of the Radical Reformation is that it's very popular, meaning that, that the, the laity grab onto it, not only because of, of the, the teachings they have, which kind of take clergy and laity and get rid of it, because that's just the, that's just the political structure. We've got to get rid of that in order to reign, let Jesus reign, right? But then they also are popular because they use the language and the verbiage of the Lutheran Reformation. So they'll talk about justification. They'll talk about forgiveness. They'll use the word gospel all the time. And that's popular with the people because they know that, oh, that Roman Catholic church is wrong. We've got to be a church of the gospel. All right, so the anti uh Catholicism stuff, uh, motivates people to join this group. And this group then, of course, has a strong emphasis on lay preachers. Because in the end, you get rid of all these distinctions between clergy and laity and so forth. Because you never know just who the Holy Spirit's going to be speaking through. Because, of course, as a radical reformer, the Holy Spirit is, is teaching a new thing. And he can do that. Right? All right, so there are some early reformers that are radicals. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Andreas Karlstadt, who starts out as a Lutheran. He is a colleague of Luther. In fact, he's at Wittenberg before Luther is. And he starts thinking of reforms even before Luther does.
But when Luther gets things going, Karlstedt grabs onto them, becomes a staunch defender of them, but he holds privately that these are just not far enough. So after the Diet at Worms uh, in 1521, as Luther goes into hiding, Karlstedt takes up the helm. He's going to be the great reformer now. And so he starts reforms. Okay? Uh, he purged sacrifice language from the Mass. Not necessarily a bad thing. He commands that there be no elevation of the elements. So the Lord's body and blood are not lifted up uh, so that people can realize the sanctity and reverence of what's going on. He, get, he gets a wit of vestments. Right? Common clothes only. He shouts the words of institution, which is not necessarily a bad problem. Prior to that, the Roman Catholics, of course, mumbled them quietly because all that mattered in the Lord's Supper is that the priest was there consecrating the bread and the wine, transforming them by his indelible character uh, into the body and blood of Christ. Uh, so, so Karlstedt has it shouted. Now, Luther, when he does this, uh, he doesn't have them shouted. He actually sets them to music, chants them words of institution. Okay? Uh, he uses, uh, Karlstedt says using German is important throughout the service. We understand vernacular as, as Lutherans, right? He commands communion in both kinds, so the laity receive the cup right away. And he rejects confession as preparation for the supper. So he's kind of a good example of the Radical Reformation. They take some of the good stuff from Luther, and then they go too far. Right? Hearing the words of institution, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Getting rid of vestments, getting rid of confession, or even more so, getting rid of absolution prior to receiving the supper, that's not a good thing. Right? Karlstadt, as he grows uh, in his radicalism, he becomes an iconoclast, meaning that he hates Christian artwork. He thinks it is idolatry. Okay? You all go to the Christian bookstore, right? And you see the Ten Commandments, and are they the Lutheran Ten Commandments usually? No, usually you get the number two is what? You shall have no graven images. All right. Karlstad would be in favor of that one. All right? Uh, the, 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 the mistake there, of course, being that what creates an idol? The, the trust of the human heart. It's not the object itself. All right? Uh, he becomes anti-intellectual, so he takes all of his, his fancy learning, so to speak, and all of his PhDs because he's a brilliant man, and he sets them aside because he's going to be common, common brother Andreas rather than Dr. Karlstadt. Okay? He, he has disagreements with Luther. Um, uh, there's a, in particular, there's a, a strong amount of disagreement with Luther about where he's serving on whether or not he's rightly called there or not. Uh, Luther writes some things against him. Uh, later shows that in history, actually, that, that maybe Luther was a little bit wrong in, in contesting it, that he may, maybe actually did have a right call there. Um, but yet, despite it all, what's interesting is that, do you know, uh, on Luther on his wedding night, do you know who was his guest at the Black Cloister on his wedding night? It was Andreas Karlstadt, who had been run out of a town and was seeking uh, help. Sanctuary. Uh, faith active in love, right? Even towards the enemy. Okay, uh, Karlstedt becomes Zwinglian on the Lord's Supper, so the Lord's Supper becomes symbolic and spiritual only, right? So he denies the real presence of Christ and so forth. And he influences many of the fathers of the Radical Reformation uh, that later become Amish, Mennonite, and so forth, right? Uh, yeah. So we'll move on to the next one, which is a guy named Thomas Munzer, all right? Munster is, uh, is a, another radical reformer. He has this quote, which I will use. Uh, the Bible is not infallible, but incomplete. The Holy Spirit can and does use reason to impart new teaching and new practice. That really captures the, the, the spirit of the radical reformation. Okay? So Munster is, is strongly mystical, Strongly experiential, strongly emotional in his spirituality, right? 
In all of these two, Munster and Karlstadt kind of prime the pump for the Peasants' Revolt that we read about in our Lutheran history books, right? So Peasants' Revolt happens in the mid-1520s. And what happens is the German peasantry gets word of the Reformation. And they start applying Luther's teachings. They see that, you know, Luther is speaking the law to these princes who are, who are uh, having economic policies and so forth that are, that are hindering the freedom of the people, that are hurting people. They're not doing their job as Christian nobility. And so they really start thinking that Luther is on their side. Luther is sympathetic to their concerns, right? But then, of course, they take it to the next level, which is what radicals do. They take it to the point of violence, revolt, rebellion. They start tearing into churches and destroying towns and going after princes' estates and all these other things, right? And so Luther uh, eventually has to come out publicly against them, right? Um, the radicals uh, quoted, of course, in their efforts to rebel that they, they had God on their side. Reminiscent of the, of the Bob Dylan song of the same title, right? Uh, but in their claiming to do that, they show that they're truly enthusiasts. That is, they trust a word outside of God's word, because if God's word would say, of course, that you submit to the ruling authorities as God's agents. Right? But this, as enthusiasts, they believe a different word. Right? Um, yeah. So then uh, Luther writes, and he says, you know, the peasants have taken upon themselves the burdens of three terrible sins against God and man. By this they have merited death in body and in soul. They have sworn to be true and faithful, submissive and obedient to their rulers, but now they are deliberately and violently breaking this oath. They are starting a rebellion and are violently robbing and plundering monasteries and castles which are not theirs. They have doubly deserved death in body and soul as highwaymen and murderers. They cloak this terrible and horrible sin with the gospel. Thus they blame the worst blasphemers of God and slanderers of his, or they become the worst blasphemers of God and slanderers of his holy name. Uh, Luther did not like a rebel. He did not. Uh, he viewed even uh, so much as this kind of false teaching, he viewed heresy as a threat to national security. Right? Kind of strange for our American sensibilities of, of church and state. But he said, of course, uh, errors in theology will result in errors in life. So you'll end up with rebellion and things like that because the people are not believing correctly about God's gift of this earth and how it should be kept in order, right? So then, of course, the consequence to that is also Luther has no problem encouraging Christian princes to rule over what is taught in their lands. Thank God for it, as we heard about the presentation of the Augsburg Confession by princes. All right, so the peasant revolt is put down severely by the German princes because it is a threat to their nations, to their kingdoms, so to speak. All right, so next guy I want to talk about is a guy that is mentioned several times in Lutheran Confessions. His name is Caspar von Schenkf or Schwenkfeld. All right, he is, he is condemned multiple times in the Confessions. Uh, he is one of the fathers of, of radical reformation and so forth. Uh, the von, of course, means that he's someone important in Germany. All right. Uh, he falls away. He starts out with Luther right away, uh, but he falls away from Luther uh, first on the Lord's Supper. As you know from Reformation studies, the Lord's Supper is, is one of those key points where diversions happen and, and where divisions start to happen. Right? Um, he puts reason over and against Scripture, so it has to make sense. So he's like an early Calvin. Right? He rejects infant baptism. He rejects oaths. He rejects the idea of denominations. Is this starting to sound familiar? Right? He rejects church order. He, he firmly, firmly teaches that the Spirit works outside of means. Lightning bolts from the sky. Right? He comes up with something called the heavenly flesh doctrine. This is how you have to try to make the Lord's Supper work. You have to do some weird Christology things. You have to make Jesus things he's not. Uh, he says, two, two natures of Christ, uh, the human nature becomes more and more divine. 
uh, which is, of course, an early church heresy. Right? So that's Schwenkfeld. And then we get to Zwingli, and you guys know Zwingli a little bit. Ulrich Zwingli is a radical reformer. Uh, he's the one that kind of comes to the forefront, though, because he, he's kind of the leader of the Swiss Reformation, uh, which is a radical reformation. And he and Luther have their big meeting at Marburg, and they agree on 14 and two-thirds of 15 points. But they cannot agree on the Lord's Supper. Right? And Luther, seeing that they could not agree on the Lord's Supper, says, what of Zwingli? We are not of the same spirit. It's not very ecumenical of Luther. Right? Another radical reformer is a guy named Melchior Hoffman. He is one of the most influential because he becomes very popular. He's a lay preacher. He's influenced by Luther. All these guys are influenced by Luther. But again, if he's just the guy who gets the ball rolling, we take that ball and we keep running it down the field. Right? Uh, Melchior uh, thought himself a prophet and that God would undo the ungodly before his return and that all of his followers should help. This is still that revolutionary twinge to the Radical Reformation. Uh, he is a friend and disciple of Schwenkfeld and of uh, Karlstadt. And some of his followers do something uh, in, in 1535. They take over the German city of Munster. Okay, they first befriended the Lutherans in Munster, made it sound like, yes, we are all one happy Protestant family, and then they get power, and then the Lutherans are gone, right? They institute adult baptism only in the city. They start uh, referring to the city of Munster as the New Jerusalem, and they have prophets walking through their streets, right? The original leader of this revolt, uh, I cannot remember his name offhand, uh, but he dies because he uh, sees the uh, German forces that are coming to reclaim the city, and he sees them and he says, I am going to be the new Gideon. And so rather than taking all of his troops out, he says he will only take 30 men out. And he goes out and he gets slaughtered. And they put his head on a pole because he is a rebellious uh, scoundrel. And they take and put other body parts and they nail them to the doors uh, of the town. Right? Uh, Zwingli's not much different. Zwingli dies uh, fighting the Roman Catholics, and the Roman Catholics take him and divide him into quarters and uh, sow it in manure. So these are, these are how uh, these radicals, because they are revolutionaries, are treated according to the punishments of the states that they, they're fighting against. All right? So then out of this guy's death comes a guy named John of Leiden. And he is the one who comes forward and says, well, this is the new Jerusalem, and I am King David. Okay? So he begins to rule over the city as a king. He recreates all of the royal dress, as he would envision it. He takes to himself 16 wives, right? And he commands that everything in accordance with the book of Acts must be held in common while they all starve together, okay? Munster is put down. Almost everyone that was a part of it is killed. And from Munster, comes the idea that maybe this radical reformation should be spiritual only. And so from that point forward, the radicals become pacifists. So when you, uh, when you think of your Mennonite friends or Amish folks or anything like that, uh, their pacifism is based upon a couple very badly planned revolutionary acts. They view the only way that they're going to survive is to become pacifists. All right. The fundamental problem of the Radical Reformation is that they take the means of grace and they reject it. They take the idea that God uses these things that his word says he uses and these things only 
and they jettison it. Are you getting why we're talking about this at the conference? Because this is the fundamental problem of uh, our synod and of many churches to reject the means of grace as the way, the only way in which God works. Right? Now, John Calvin, I mentioned his name a couple times. He's related to these guys, but he's always second generation. You have to remember that. He comes around at the very end of Luther's life. Right? But in the same respect, he embraces the same kind of enthusiastic thinking outside of the Word of God. Calvin, for him, what rules and dictates everything is logic. The Christian faith has to make sense. You know, he, he hates uh, something that is not, uh, you know, he doesn't like un, uh, loosened ends in anything. Right? Right? Okay? It's most evident in his theology of the Lord's Supper where, of course, he says the, the finite, that is the bread and the wine, cannot contain the infinite. Christ's body and blood. Christ who's divine, right? Um, yeah. Um, one of the notes I put down for Calvin is that Calvin ends up being anti-Catholic instead of being anti-Papist. as Lutherans, we're, we're anti-papist. But we're not anti-Catholic. Right? Uh, Calvin, of course, also because he's of this kind of same twinge, he has no problem with, with bringing up theocracies and trying to rule government by, by the Bible. As we find out with his experiments in church governments. Right, so we talked about the reaction to this radical reformation on a political spectrum. The princes squash it because it's revolutionary. It's causing disturbance in the peace and quietness of people's lives. So a prince, being God's agent for order, punishes their wickedness uh, by bearing the sword. Now theologically, there's also a response. Luther writes against these guys all the time. One of the great pieces against the heavenly prophets is one of his great pieces in the 1520s where he references this. The Augsburg Confession is filled with condemnations of, of the Anabaptists, of the radical reformers. Anabaptists is just a fancy word for saying rebaptizers because they believed in adult or believer's baptism. Who does that sound like today? Right? So in the Augsburg Confession, we have Article 5, uh, where it condemns this kind of enthusiasm that we can bring about these changes by our own means and our methods. Augsburg 9, uh, where it condemns this idea of believer's baptism uh, and, of course, embraces the teaching of Scripture about infant baptism, that this is God at work. Right? The 10th article of the Augsburg Confession, uh, they, they, re they condemn the Anabaptists because of their spiritual presence in regards to the Lord's Supper. In Article 12, they condemn the Anabaptists because the Anabaptists believe that once saved, you're always saved. Which is not what the Scriptures teach. They also condemn in that one the Anabaptists for, for teaching uh, that, they, that perfection can be achieved in this life. Right? Which the Methodists run with. Augsburg, 20, uh, uh, or Augsburg tw uh, 16, of course... Uh, they said Christians cannot serve in government. That's, again, a new revelation for them because when they thought they could serve in government, they ran into trouble. Right? And then also there were some Anabaptists who believed that uh, hell was not eternal. And that is condemned there. If you want to look at how the Augsburg Confession treats us, all these different things, uh, Article 15 deals a lot with how we conserve the usages of the church, that is, the practices that the church has. Okay, so that's the other side. The conservative reformation, as Krauth coins the word, it, it keeps what is good and what is true. So this is Luther looking at the Roman Catholic Mass. This is Luther looking at the piety that he had received from generations before. He keeps what is good, what is true, and he keeps everything that is not militating against the gospel. Okay? 
This is, this is simple to hear, but of course it, it's difficult in the working out. Um, the conservative reformation says that theology can be known. In fact, it has to be because that's what's confessed. As we see in, in, in the formula of Concord that I read at the start. All right? Th these are not guys who have doubts or who think that they've only got 90% of the truth. These are guys who say, this is it. And on this I will rest. And on this I'm going to stand before Jesus on judgment day. Okay? It is uh, biblical. It is, it's, it's interested in scripture and what scripture's teachings have to say. It is anti-enthusiastic in the sense that not that they're not raw rock, because they are. They're bold in their confession. But it is anti-enthusiastic in that it, it stays to scripture. Here I stand, right? Mimicking Paul's words in Ephesians 6. Right? Uh, the conservative reformation is oftentimes called too Catholic. Right? Yeah. From the Augsburg Confession. Only those things have been recounted whereof we, ta we thought that it was necessary to speak, in order that it might be understood that in doctrine and ceremonies, nothing has been received on our part against Scripture or the Church Catholic. For it is manifest that we have taken most diligent care that no new and ungodly doctrine should creep into our churches. That's the Conservative Reformation. And that was the last paragraph of the Augsburg Confession. But none of this is new. As we, as we hear of the Reformation, uh, it's not like, you know, out of, out of nowhere in the 1500s, God did a new thing. This is what God's been doing since the start. And this is, of course, what the devil's been doing since the start as well. Um, from the Small Cold Articles, which is Pastor Hull's favorite confessional document, um, this is Luther. In those things which concern the spoken outward word, we must firmly hold that God grants his spirit or grace to no one except through or with the preceding outward word. In order that we may thus be protected against the enthusiasts, i.e. spirits who boast that they have the spirit without and before the word, and accordingly judge scripture or the spoken word and explain and stretch it at their pleasure, as Munzer did, Thomas Munzer, and many still do at the present day, who wish to be acute judges between the spirit and the letter, and yet know not what they say or declare. For indeed, the papacy also is nothing but sheer enthusiasm, by which the pope boasts that all rights exist in the shrine of his heart. And whatever he decides and commands within his church is spirit and right, even though it is above and contrary to scripture and the spoken word. All this... All this is the old devil and old serpent who also converted Adam and Eve into enthusiasts and led them from the outward word of God to spiritualizing and self-conceit. And nevertheless, he accomplished this through other outward words, just as also our enthusiasts at the present day condemn the outward word, and nevertheless, they themselves are not silent but they fill the world with their prattings and writings, as though indeed the Spirit could not come through the writings and spoken word of the apostles, but first through their own writings and words he must come. Why then do they not also omit their own sermons and writings until the Spirit himself come to men without their writings and before them, as they boast that he has come into them without the preaching of the scriptures? But of these matters, there is not time now to dispute at greater length. We have elsewhere sufficiently urged this subject. All right, so Luther is addressing this enthusiasm that is natural in man. In fact, so natural it goes back to the fall. That's the original sin. A trusting of a different word than God's word. And then because it's awesome, I'll just keep reading. Um, in a word, enthusiasm inheres in Adam and his children from the beginning, from the first fall to the end of the world. It's poison having been implanted and infused into them by the old dragon. And it is the origin, power, life, and strength of all heresy, especially of that of the papacy and Muhammad. Therefore, we ought and must constantly maintain this point that God does not wish to deal with us otherwise than through the spoken word and the sacraments. It is the devil himself 
whatsoever is extolled as spirit without the word and sacraments. For God wished to appear even to Moses through the burning bush and the spoken word, and no prophet, neither Elijah nor Elisha, received the spirit without the Ten Commandments or spoken word. Neither was John the Baptist conceived without the preceding word of Gabriel, nor did he leap in his mother's womb without the voice of Mary. And Peter says, The prophecy came not by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. Without the outward word, however, they were not holy, much less would the Holy Ghost have moved them to speak when they were still unholy or profane. For they were holy, says he, since the Holy Ghost spake through them. This, this is the key of the conservative reformation, that, that God speaks, acts, does everything God's going to do through the word and the sacraments. And that's it. If you want to go beyond that, join the radicals. But this is the Lutheran principle. We stay with these things. And so Luther goes back to the garden, and that is, of course, the first sin, the enthusiasm of Eve and Adam uh, in believing the word of the serpent over the word of God. It's a sin of the Israelites as they're in the, in the exodus, uh, in the wilderness, and they, they grab onto the golden calf. You know, we're going to worship the Lord. They're going to worship Yahweh, uh, but they're going to do it using Egyptian or pagan forms of worship. And the fruit of that, of course, is the people rose up and played. That's the sanitized version. Right? It led to sensuality outside of the word. They were trusting emotions, experiences, everything else. This is the stuff of Deuteronomy 6, what it warns about when it says that this faith is what you're supposed to have in your house, everywhere you're supposed to have it when you rise up, when you go to bed, everything is supposed to be about this faith. So even in Scripture, we see this conserving going on. Later, when you get Jesus on the night when he's betrayed, he's having that long discourse in John with his disciples, and he's teaching about the Holy Spirit, who must come. But he says, if you love me, you will keep my word. Not as a checklist. But you're going to keep his word. You're going to guard it and treasure it. This is what God has given you. Not something else. This. This is what Jesus says over and over again when he uses the Old Testament. This is what Jesus says when he talks about the role of the Holy Spirit, that he will take what is Christ, take what is the Father's, and he will give that. The Holy Spirit's not coming up with new stuff. He's taking what Christ has. He's giving that. So even in the Trinity, you see conserving. The church, as you find in the book of Acts, uses synagogues. They use the patterns of worship that they had already found and already had and already been accustomed to. They quote prophets. In fact, it, the church in Acts is a, is a Reformation church. They're taking what they've been given and going back to it. What do you think Jesus preaches to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and stuff about? He's reforming. Getting them back to what the Scriptures were actually about. Right? The whole relationship, in fact, between the New and Old Testaments shows the spirit of the conservative Reformation. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, you know, from what I've received, that which I give. Paul's not coming up with anything new. When Paul talks about pastors as stewards, pastors aren't coming up with anything new. When Paul talks about using the sound pattern of words, he's not saying, hey, come up with some new ways to talk about this. He's, using, he's saying, say the same words. Follow the sound pattern. That's the danger in creating new terms and, 
and using words uh, differently. Revelation, that great warning at the end. If anyone adds to the words of this book or takes away from them, right, let them be cursed. It's conservative. This goes on right beyond the New Testament period into the early church. Uh, you have Gnostics, and including guys like Marcion, who are going around teaching new things, new revelations, gnosis, knowledge. Right? And they're condemned as heretics for it. You have the very canon. How the, how the canon of the New Testament and Old Testament come together is conservative. They kept that which they had been given. The creeds. They're conservative. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. That word apostolic is a conservative word. It takes what has been given and passes it down. If we would have chose to be one holy Christian and prophetic church, that would have been quite a different story. Right? That was actually a debate at the council. All right? Uh, so we get all the way into Luther and the reforms as we talked about, especially the reforms that happen about worship. And, and Pastor Bean will talk about more of this tomorrow, about the reforms of Lutheran Reformation worship. All right? Luther says, you keep what you can keep without sin. You can keep what you keep that serves the gospel. We're liturgical as Lutherans not because we like it. We're liturgical as Lutherans because that delivers the gospel. We only remove that which does not serve the gospel. Okay? Our services exist so that the word of God would have free course among us. So whatever would prohibit that, that we get rid of. The catechism itself is a conservative document. Luther took what he had been given in his, in his piety, and he restructures it according to theology. Professor Pless will teach about that tomorrow, I imagine. All right? Uh, theology ruled over all these forms, all these different practices, any changes that went on. Uh, it wasn't Luther's desire uh, to change things uh, for like new or outreach methods or anything like that. Uh, it had to do with our beliefs determined what we did. The conservative Reformation, especially as you see it in Luther, respected and honored his fathers in the faith. Whereas the radicals would make themselves the fathers. In fact, many radicals talked that way. They talked about how they are the, the mature ones, whereas the early church was immature. And then even Luther would be kind of a step along that progress. But they are the truly mature ones in the faith. Okay. Christian freedom was wedded to Christian love. Okay. And yes, the gospel makes us free, but our freedom is not for ourselves. Our confessions do this, they're conservative in their reforms. They include things like the ecumenical creeds centuries before. They also did an interesting thing when they got to the formula. They did not include documents that happened to be written between Luther's death and when the formula was created. There were many good confessions between that time, especially against the interims and so forth, but they chose because they wanted to conserve that which they agreed upon previously. They chose to exclude those, and they stuck with the Augsburg, Schmall called treatise, apology, catechisms, those things. This goes on beyond the era of the confessions, uh, dead orthodoxy versus pietism. The pietists take, an, take a, a, a branch from the radicals, and they start thinking of things other than the word and the sacraments, which seem to be dead and dull and boring and so forth. And they say, we need to spice this up with small groups. The original small group is from the pietists. They also subjectivize the faith. So it's not about the outward confession, the objective truth of Christ and the gospel. It's about your experience of it, which is a radical reformation thing. Okay? 
So these things become really the new sacraments. Your personal experience, your small group. That's how God's going to work. Right? I, I started out by talking about Charles Porterfield Croft. He is a uh, mid-1800s uh, Lutheran pastor and so forth. He, he noted that in the 1800s, uh, Lutherans, this is before the Missourians came over, um, the, and he's talked about how Lutherans of that day believed that Luther only started things. That Lutheran, uh, they viewed the Lutheran confessions and Luther himself as being trapped in their time and their culture. So it was contextual. Another word you'll hear nowadays. Okay? He writes against guys like Schmucker and Kurtz, who are Lutherans of that time, uh, who wanted to see more union with the Reformed. Because, of course, they had the same view of Luther as the Reformed. That he got started. And we're just carrying it on. Uh, Walther, of course, and the Missouri Synod folks, they, uh, they grab onto this conservative reformation. Walther does it so much so that, that people don't really think him a genuine, uh, real theologian. They just say, he just makes quotes. He, he's a repristinator. Well, that's what it means to be a conservative reformation, is you, you reprint. I say that as repristination presses in the back there. So... <laughs> but that's what it means, conservative. You, you, re, you quote the fathers. You don't have anything new to say. Just say what they said. It's a good thing. Okay? All right, and you see this go on and on and so forth. In the 20th century, we get stuff like Herman Sasse, uh, who I imagine Professor Pless will probably mention a few times. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a book he wrote uh, in the 20th century called Here We Stand. That would be a really good volume for you to pick up uh, as we look forward to the 500th year of the Reformation. Because in that book, he describes how the Reformation is misused uh, for nationalistic goals and, and the kind of things like that. So I mentioned at the beginning that I will speak just a little bit about how this radical Reformation has kind of infested even the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So radical Reformation was about denying the means of grace. Defi denying their efficacy to create and sustain the church. This is church growth stuff, right? This is all the, the greeters programs and everything else you can put together that are supposed to spice up the church, right? Make her alluring once again, right? Yeah. This is all the visionary leadership stuff you hear. The radical reformers were visionary. The Lutherans were not. Okay? This is all the programs and stuff you see promoted for different things. That, oh, if we just follow this program, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see this result. How is that different than what the radical reformers said when they said, you know what, we can bring the kingdom of God here by doing this? It's not different. You see this in our synod when you hear of people talking about mercy work as evangelism. As if we, you know, give enough t-shirts out that people will become Christians. That's a denial of the means of grace. All right. You see functional misuses of the means of grace in our synod. Uh, you have the, the great and famous term now, sacramental entrepreneurs. All right. So this is like the semi-Pelagianism of, of the means of grace. And by that I mean Pelagianism was of course saying that man has all the free power in the world, he can do whatever he wants. There's enough verses in scripture to say that's probably not a good thing to tell. Right? But then the, the teaching came in called semi-Pelagianism which said, well, okay, yeah, man doesn't have the power to do that, he doesn't have the free will to do that, but, but God gives him the first push and then, then man takes over. Right? So a functional misuse of the means of grace is to say, oh yeah, well, baptism empowers you. Now you can really get out there and do something. That's just a starting point. No. You have the gross misuse of the means of grace going on. Uh, you actually have LCMS churches that do rebaptisms. Infant communion, open communion is rampant. 
You have other sacraments that are being used. Talk to your friends about why they go to their church. Because the band plays really good. Right? Because I've got such great relationships there. Right? We still have the sacrament of confirmation. Right? The sacrament of missionary zeal. The sacrament of business or entrepreneurial sense. Right? You have the same radical reformation that tries to downplay all the differences that are out there. All right, remember, because the Anabaptists, the radical reformers, were against denominations. Come on, we're all brothers. Except for you who were baptized as infants, that didn't count. Right? Right? So you have the downplay of the divisions and the differences. So this is prevalent in the Reformation amongst the radicals, but it's also prevalent in the other Reformations. Guess what? Why did they try to get Luther and Zwingli together at Marburg? Because the Turk was threatening again. So let's get past these religious differences. There's real work that needs to be done. Right? Augsburg happens because the emperor is looking to try to unite the Lutherans and the Catholics. He's tired of all this fighting in his own kingdom. Or in making sure that we have koinonia. Unity is, in our synod, trying to be found in things like our uh, mutual rights like ordination. Oh, you pastors are all united because you take the same ordination vows. You pastors are all united because you submit to the same structure you sign in the Constitution and bylaws. That's not Lutheran. The radicals would find their unity in their subjective experience like vows not in the pure gospel and in right administration of the sacraments, as Augsburg 7 confesses. The anti-denominationalism of the radicals, you see that also um, amongst uh, LCMS Lutherans. Comes up in closed communion pretty often, right? Other things as well. Right? Why can't we all just work together, get along, those kind of stuff? Um, yeah, that of course then plays out in unionism and syncretism, praying in stadiums and stuff like that. Right? But 1 Corinthians talks about that a little bit. It says the divisions are necessary, so denominations aren't all that evil. You know why Paul says divisions are necessary? So that you would know who is genuine. Right? Yeah, spe Jesus speaks of the need for division, that he came to divide. And so long as Jesus is the reason for the divide, that's great. That's what Scripture says. Uh, lay preaching, obviously, uh, in the Missouri Synod, very commonplace, as it was in the Radical, radical Reformation. Uh, the idea of the Lutheran confessions being contextualized or historically explained away as that's German culture, uh, they were just starting, those kind of ideas... Very prevalent in our synod today. The idea that you can't know all theology. Because remember, for the, for the Anabaptists, for the radicals, it was because the Holy Spirit might do something new tomorrow. But that idea is very prevalent today. You can't be 100% certain of the truth. All right? It's not what our confessors, the, the fathers of our faith said. Uh, the idea of, of this idea of Luther being a trajectory that he's setting us in a direction. You see that all the time now. Even in some of our own scholarly journals, you see a lot of articles that talk about toward a, insert whatever here. We used to confess the faith, not something toward a, what is that even? Experiential theologies, the subjectivism, rife. Because again, this is the natural religion of man. This is what Adam and Eve sell us out to in the garden. Uh, the visionaries and so forth, you see that all over in the Synod as well. Um, if you ever want to think about that a little bit, especially those pastors out there, uh, how is that visionary leadership stuff uh, related to donatism? An early church heresy. Right? All right. Um, 
I will speak a little bit about the lack of confessional reaction. And the Augsburg Confession, when it ran across these radicals, it condemned them. They literally said, condemn, dom not. Okay? Um, and then as I'm running out of time, uh, just to remember, Krauth is the one who comes up with that uh, neat series of sequence of events in the progression of error in a church body. Now first the error tries to excuse itself, oh, we're just a small little group, just let us be. And then of course error asks, well, you know, We'd like to have the same, you know, give us the same podium. We'd like to be equal. We'd like to dialogue. And then, of course, error takes the helm and punishes the truth and those who would say the truth. So hopefully you've gotten a sense for the Radical Reformation and what it brought and also how it is the natural religion of man from the start until even present day in our own church body. Read again that last paragraph of the book of Concord. Since now in the sight of God and of all Christendom, the entire church of Christ, we wish to testify to those now living and those who shall come after us, that's us, that this declaration herewith presented concerning all the controverted articles aforementioned and explained, and no other is our faith, doctrine, and confession in which we are also willing by God's grace to appear with intrepid hearts. That's fearlessness before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and give an account of it. And that we will neither privately, that's hypocritical, or publicly speak or write anything contrary to it. But by the help of God's grace intend to abide thereby. Therefore, after mature deliberation we have in God's fear and with the invocation of his name attached our signatures with our own hands. This was their confession. And this is our confession. May we always abide in it. All right. Thank you for listening.